Hello there. Thanks for joining us on this informative edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm your host, Theodore Henry. In the words of national hero Marcus Garvey, if you have no confidence in self, you are twice defeated in the race of life. With confidence, you have won before you've even started. We have lots in store that you won't want to miss, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hurricanes can be dangerous, catastrophic events, but we can lessen the damage if we are prepared. Keep up to date with the latest information from reliable sources such as the Meteorological Service and OddBem. The power will probably go with the internet following, so a good old battery-operated radio is a must-have. Stock up on non-perishable food items and emergency items such as flashlights and extra batteries. Secure important documents. Have a pre-packed emergency bag with safety gear such as raincoats and water boots. Ensure windows are protected and roofing is secured. Have updated information on emergency shelters near you in case you need to evacuate during the storm. Preparation will lessen the devastation when dealing with a hurricane. Be prepared. Good day, I'm Twyla Whelan and this is your Jazz News for Wednesday, August 7, 2024. Farmers across the island are being encouraged to embrace the nature of resilience as they rebuild from losses incurred due to the passage of Hurricane Beryl. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says our farmers have the characteristics to be able to quickly bounce back from a shock or crisis and to do so stronger. He was addressing the main ceremony of the 70th Denby Agricultural, Industrial and Food Show on Independence Day. Life is filled with unknown quantities and they are going to happen and they are going to create problems for us. But those crises that are created also bring opportunities to change the way how we were doing things before to bring in new ways of doing things that were better than the old ways. So we must not look upon challenges and adversity with a fear. Guest speaker at the event, Premier of the Cayman Islands, Juliana Yvonne O'Connor Connolly, assured the nation that Jamaica was on the rise from this setback. When we went to St. Vincent and to visit our brothers there and the Grenadines as well as Grenada, Grenada took a mantra that we shall rise again. Well, I didn't want to say it then to my learned friend, the PM, but I think they almost borrowed that spirit from Jamaica because Jamaica, the more you knock you down, no matter what the chances are, the more you build up, become better, and you've made your mark across the world. Meanwhile, it was announced at Denby that an additional $1.4 billion had been allocated for recovery efforts in the agriculture and fishery sectors. A preliminary response of $700 million was previously announced. Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries Floyd Green says that from the newly allocated $1.4 billion, $100 million will go to the rehabilitation of fishing beaches. Not to build it back like it was, but to build it back better so that it can withstand natural disasters of this nature. We're going to be focusing on Rocky Point, Bormont, Old Harbor Bay and down in St. Elizabeth as well. Minister Green reveals that 11,000 fishers have been affected by Hurricane Beryl, with 25 fishing gear sheds having been destroyed in Rocky Point alone. $100 million is also being allocated to greenhouse farmers, which is an additional response to the previous $25 million. Funds will also go towards the build-out of storage facilities. One of the challenges we have in natural disasters, we say to our farmers, go out, harvest what you can, so that the storm don't destroy it. But unfortunately, the farmers harvest, but then they have nowhere to store it. We are going to be building out solar-powered storage capacity so that when you harvest for a storm, you can put it up and we can have it after the storm. Damage to the agriculture sector is estimated at close to $6 billion, with approximately 48,000 farmers affected. Minister Green congratulates the team and participants for compacting the three-day Denby show into a one-day event in the face of that destruction. Still on agriculture, 
State Minister Franklin Witter has welcomed a $12 million donation from Caribbean Chemicals Jamaica towards the sector's recovery efforts. The donation was handed over during a recent ceremony in St. Elizabeth. The items include drip tape, potting soil, seed trees, insecticides, herbicides and fertilizers. The resources will benefit farmers in the communities of Nain, Red Banks, Bull Savannah, Junction and Southfield in the parish. $12 million uh, is significant in terms of what it will do to uh, assist our, our farmers. I believe that your commitment to support our farmers in this challenging time is a testament of the strength and res resilience of our agricultural community. The partnership demonstrates the power of collaboration between private sector and the government and the Ministry of Agriculture and our farmers. Managing Director of Caribbean Chemicals Jamaica, Graham Dunkley, says the donation will be supported by a three-phased relief initiative. These involve the provision of material directly to farmers, on-farm technical assistance, and capacity building training. CCJ is, is more than just a supplier of inputs. We are your partners in progress. Our recovery initiatives are designed to empower you, help you to restore your livelihoods, and to revitalize our agricultural sector towards prosperity. Mr. Donkley says the company plans to extend support to farmers in Westmoreland, Manchester and Clarendon within a couple of weeks. As the recovery process continues, persons whose houses were completely destroyed by Hurricane Beryl were presented with relief grants of up to $400,000 during the launch of the Rebuild Jamaica initiative on Monday. Minister of Labor and Social Security Pernell Charles Jr. says the initiative aims to restore hope rebuild lives and renew communities with resilience and strength. He adds that a partnership with the Global Empowerment Mission, GEM, will provide further assistance to the beneficiaries. If the Ministry of Labor and Social Security provides for a beneficiary $150,000 and you have lost your roof, you can now elect through our partnership to put that $150,000 toward the labor cost and GEMS will come in and provide the material and resources that are necessary to give you a new roof. Minister Charles Jr. is calling on the beneficiaries to be smart and responsible in how the grants are used. It is now essential for us to call and appeal to all who receive these cash grants. You are responsible, you are accountable to ensure that it is used wisely and for the benefit of yourself and your children and your community. This is not to be wasted on foolishness. This is a time when we expect the consciousness of Jamaica to kick in. And finally, 57 companies have been selected to push export expansion under the Enterprise Development for Export Growth Program, Export Max. The companies, which represent the fourth cohort of participants, will benefit from capacity development, export promotion, mentorship and advocacy over a period of two years. We absolutely must export a lot more. Export Max is right there up front. Lots of other companies are doing it. And it is us who must carve our economic independence. Key areas of focus will include accounting, management, productivity improvements, sales training, exporting, access to financial support, and marketing plans. Export Max will also help the companies participate in missions and trade fairs, cross-border selling, closing deals, and signing contracts. Through our advocacy agenda and our mentorship and coaching program, as well as tailored development and promotional solutions. Drive the success of your company through a unique blend of technical training, expert guidance, and on-the-ground promotional activities. And three, expand your company's global reach through our established in-market connections and a proven formula to successfully enter new markets or expand into existing markets. Export Max is designed to enhance the competitiveness and sustainability of Jamaican companies to drive increase in export earnings. The program is being implemented by the Jamaica Promotion Corporation, JAMPRO, in partnership with the Jamaica Business Development Corporation and the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association. And that's it for JS News Today. I'm Twyla Whelan. Thanks for watching.
Our oceans are coming under environmental threats. There are three major environmental threats. They call it the triple planetary crisis and there's no area of the world that is immune to these challenges. Challenge one is climate change. Challenge two is biodiversity loss. Challenge three is pollution. Climate change is the warming of our atmosphere. It is the changing of our weather patterns. We know that it's because of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide being released into the environment at a rate that the environment can't absorb it. What that's causing is warming of our oceans at a rate which is frightening. It doesn't allow the organisms that live in your ocean to adapt as fast as they need to. That's one of the things that's affecting biodiversity loss in the oceans. If people use unsustainable fishing practices, then you take more fish than you need. You don't allow the oceans to replenish itself and to be as healthy as it can. So when you have people that use nets that are too small, or fish out baby parrot fish, they are committing a crime in some cases, but they're actually harming the ocean that you own a part of. The third issue, which we have the capacity to deal with, is the pollution issue. To generate ocean wealth, we need to have ocean health. We all have disagreements with others at some point, but that does not mean the situation has to escalate into a physical conflict. If things do, however, get out of hand and it becomes a legal matter, government is promoting mediation as a way of settling disputes. Let's learn more about the process. is unhealthy for productivity in the workplace. You guys can't continue like this. And she come in in the morning and, and she, I'm trying to All show right. her she just All act right. like idiot. All right, so hear what? I have a video from the Dispute Resolution Foundation that I think you guys need to watch. Come with me. A conflict is at its most fundamental, a disagreement. Workplace conflict has a number of significant impacts. There's a cost to conflict at the workplace. So someone seeing a dispute between two employees or between employees and the employer being played out in public might be inconvenienced by what is happening, but they're unaware of what's the cost. There are all kinds of costs, from personal costs, health costs, reputational costs, to financial costs. So conflict can impact somebody at the workplace. It can impact the production and productivity of the business. If you think of it, any workplace could find that between a supervisor or just between two employees, it could be an unresolved conflict and it affects how they work. So if we have to work in a way that says your work is affecting mine and vice versa and we're not getting along, then over time what will happen is that we tend not to be very productive because we're not communicating with each other, we're not responding, we're not engaged. So it affects the organization's relationship internally, it affects the dynamics of that, it affects productivity, it affects communication, it affects a number of things. So simple things like management decisions may be impacted by conflict at the workplace. Mediation is very, very important in order to solve conflicts like these and to ensure that we have productivity. Conflict resolution is a very broad term used to describe different approaches to try and manage conflict when conflict occurs. So mediation is just one of those processes, a very structured process in which a neutral third party who is trained helps disputing parties to come to a resolution of their dispute. Now, at the workplace, that will be helping them to negotiate 
so they may be unable to negotiate by themselves so they may get somebody who is external to each of them to help them to resolve that dispute and that person would play the role of a mediator so guys this is where i come in to sit with you both and to discuss the issue further but before we get to the meat of the matter there is just one more point to note now in order to do that, the mediator has to have some very effective communication skills. So how does the mediator communicate? And communicate in a way that includes both verbal and non-verbal, but at the same time interpreting what is it that the verbal and non-verbal cues that are coming from the parties. What are those cues saying? So the mediator has to be very effective at communication. Now, helping the parties to communicate may be a part of the communication, the larger communication skills of the mediator. However, at a particular point in time, mediator has to help the parties to negotiate. So the mediator has to be au fait with what negotiation is about, how are the parties negotiating, and help them to be able to negotiate in a way that settles the dispute that they have. All right, so as you guys can see, conflict is not new. Today was probably the first for you guys and it maybe won't be the last. But based on the video that you've just seen, you can now tell the true effect of what conflict can do within the organization. So you see it's very important for you to practice mediation and proper conflict resolutions. Now having seen or heard all of that, what really happened today? Make every effort to forge unity yeah, yeah, yeah. and resolve to work hard for our prosperity. Leaving our children a legacy of hope, breaking the shackles and smashing the old. As we continue to bask in the independent celebration glow, let's find a bit of relaxation in enjoying one of the natural beauties that serve as a symbol of our nationhood. This tree represents the resilience and the hope of the people while being a practical source for economic creations. Keep watching to see what marvel of nature I'm talking about. The Blue Maho belongs to a family called Malvesi. Um, it's the same family that includes um, ornamental shrubs like shoe black. So the scientific name for the blue maho is Hibiscus elatus. I, I imagine that this, this, the specific name, which is the elatus, would indicate the fact that it is lofty and grows to, to great height. The blue mahos, everyone knows, is our national tree. Jamaica has well over hundreds of native trees. Um, it's easy to understand that the, the combination of characteristics that makes the, uh, the maho unique is probably what gave it the edge over all those other hundreds of trees. The native range of the blue maho is to the northeastern corner of Jamaica, which is Portland, sections of the Junker Mountain. The Blue Maho blooms in the latter part of the, of the, of the, of the calendar. The typical color is a, f a kind of flaming reddish orange. It's more red than orange. The older the flower becomes, the redder it becomes. It bears a pod that splits um, in the drier part of the early uh, section of the year, the first quarter of the year. 
and the forestry department propagates the species by collecting the pods. We process them by drying them in trays and then we extract the seeds. The traditional uses is a fairly wide array. Um, it's used for furnishings, for furniture, um, for turnery, so you can make um, articles out of it. The beauty of it is not much seen when you just cut it, but when the furniture is made and you look at it, you see various colors and it go in streak and streak. And they're not looking so nice until when they varnish it. It, nothing, it, it not stained or anything, just when they polish it off when it's finished. So they use it a lot now. The strong, it reminds me of the lignum vitae. But that, the, the lignum vitae doesn't have those streaks in it like the blue mahou. So it, it makes it very special. I think people confuse the name lignum vitae and the name blue mahou with their, um, with their roles as national symbols, the one being the national flower and the other being the national tree. Can you tell which bird this is? There are over 300 species of hummingbirds in the world, and Jamaica has four types. Our national bird, the doctor bird, is one of those four, and it's endemic to the island. That means it's only found right here in Jamaica. According to sources at the Institute of Jamaica, in 1962, a committee was established to consider the recommendations for the national emblems of the country. It was at that level that the red bill streamer tail hummingbird, or doctor bird, was chosen to be Jamaica's national bird. We actually have two species of streamer tails. One is a red bill streamer tail, one is a black bill streamer tail. The red bill streamer tail and the black bill streamer tail is considered by some authorities as two separate species. Here in Jamaica, we, we still consider them to be two species. The red billed streamer tail can be found across most of the island except the eastern tip, where you'll find the black billed streamer tail. Hummingbirds' nests are made from small leafy materials woven together with cobwebs. There are about two eggs per clutch or grouping, usually one male and one female. Hummingbirds are actually sexually dimorphic. In other words, there are two different forms for male and females. The male is actually a lot more flashy. Jamaicans call the red-billed streamer tail the doctor bird because of the appearance of the male with its black crest and two iconic tail feathers resembling the top hat and coat tails of doctors in the past. The male doctor bird also has shimmering green feathers on the chest and back and a bright red bill with a black tip. The female looks very different because she has a short tail, white chest feathers, and slightly green feathers on the back. The female's bill is also dark brown with red at the base. You can actually find males without a tail, and there are several reasons for this. One, it could be a young male, right? Um, born earlier this year, for example, it's gonna take a while before those tail feathers actually grow in. And sometimes you'll actually see some with very short tail, which means it's growing in. Another reason they might lack a tail is that they might have molted it, that is they change their feathers. After the feathers get worn out, they actually drop them and a new set of feathers actually grows in. Sometimes you'll find a male with one tail feather, it lost it for one reason or the other, you know, it, it broke off, they, they could be fighting with, with each other and, and actually lost a tail feather. Hummingbirds, for their size, I mean, they're very tiny birds, but they're probably one of the most aggressive groups of birds in the entire world. The reason for this aggressive behavior is because of food scarcity. They have a group of flowers 
which they'll visit throughout the day because it takes some time for the nectar to replenish. Sometimes about half an hour, sometimes about an hour or, or longer. So what they do, they'll feed along a particular route, taking different flowers as they go along. And so they'll, once they finish feeding, they'll defend that area until it replenishes. Hummingbirds flap their wings in a figure eight motion, allowing them to change direction quickly as well as hover. But they are constantly burning so much energy that they must spend all day looking for food, only taking short rests in the shade. Hummingbirds are considered nectar feeders. And there was a time when we believe these birds fed only on nectar from flowers. But in more recent times, we realized that they do actually take insects very occasionally. And we suspect it's really just to get some supplemental protein. In terms of the trees and the flowers that the, the hummingbirds feed on, I would like to highlight that the national tree, the blue maho, is actually one of the favorite flowers of the, um, of the doctor bird. You can spot the doctor bird at many of our public gardens across the island. For example, right here at the Blue and John Kerr Mountains National Park. A United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Look at that color, shimmering emerald green. And those two long tails. Our national bird is certainly a sight to behold. Data from the National Road Safety Council shows that 90% of motorcyclists who die on our roads were not wearing a helmet. Don't let that be you. Wearing a helmet could save you and your pillion's life. In the event of a crash, the helmet can protect you against severe head injuries. Wearing a helmet can also help to reduce wind noise and light rays while driving. Let's work to reduce the carnage on our roads. Wear a helmet, ride safely. This is where we close the pages for today. Be sure to join us tomorrow on this station at this same time for another show geared to keep you in the know. Until then, visit our website, jis.gov.jm, for this and other happenings. On behalf of the entire production team, I'm Theodore Henry, leaving you with this quote from Bob Marley. You never know how strong you are until being strong is your only choice. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.